Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
O Lord, we beseech thee, make us to have a perpetual fear and love of thy holy name. For thou never failest to help and govern those whom thou hast set upon the sure foundation of thy loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and thou hast prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him, say all my familiar friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived, then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, who triest the righteous, who seest the heart and the mind, let me see thy vengeance upon them. For to thee have I committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the effect of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following But the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life.
through the one man, Jesus Christ. Then as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and flog you in their synagogues and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear testimony before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you up, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver a brother to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. 
When they persecute you in your own town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of the household? So, have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, utter in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's will. But even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. And whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to thee, thee, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Over the last few weeks, we've heard a lot of very positive sermons. They've all focused really on our mission as Christians, being sent out into a world that is lost and dark, bearing light and God's love. We are a people who are called to do so, and it's actually fitting that we have the readings we do after Pentecost, because that is the moment where the church is officially commissioned. That is where we are told to go out into the world on mission. Largely, these sermons have been positive. Largely, the readings have been positive as well. But then we are faced with the readings for today. Jeremiah opens in chapter 20 by saying, You've deceived me, Lord. And Jesus speaks of punishments coming against us for preaching the word of God by governors and by kinsmen. People will suffer for the sake of the gospel. So these readings seem to take a somber turn, which is antithetical to the more positive notes we've been experiencing the last few weeks. But I submit to you that these readings actually do encourage us. They are meant to encourage our mission in God. So I want to look at them, especially Jeremiah, because Jeremiah's text is a hard thing to read. And perhaps it's fitting, because I'm more pessimistic than many people, that I got these readings. But I find great encouragement in them, and I hope to share it with you. First things first, I have to get this out of the way. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 7, is difficult to read. Listening to a man who is at the end of his rope, who is despairing his entire life, who is accusing God of putting him in the situation he's in, is no easy thing to see. And the English translation is good, but the Hebrew words behind, behind deception and behind prevailing are very harsh words. They're very critical words. Jeremiah is not holding back from discussing his displeasure with God. So we should ask, why? Why is he, why is he this way? What, what spurred this on? We have to go back to the beginning. In Jeremiah chapter 1, we hear God make two promises, two very particular promises to Jeremiah that has we can see now have not been fulfilled. The first is that Jeremiah complains that no one will listen to him because he's a young man, and the Lord says, I will put my own words in your mouth. I'll speak through you. So, 
everything that Jeremiah says should be true, correct? If it is speaking on behalf of the Lord, and the Lord, in fact, speaking through him, everything that Jeremiah says should be listened to. It should be true. So when the Lord says that Israel and Judah will repent, when the Lord says that the people will turn their hearts back to God, you would expect it. When the Lord says that judgment is coming for those who don't, you'd expect it. And actually, the word of the Lord gives us our second promise. So the Lord promises to keep Jeremiah safe, promises that he'll defend him from the wicked people that will persecute him in this world. We see, though, by Jeremiah chapter 20 that neither of these things really have come to pass. Judah is still practicing all sorts of wickedness. Nobody has repented. Nobody has heard the word of the Lord preached. Judgment hasn't come upon the people. It seems that there's no retribution for acting however you please. Jeremiah has had a pretty hard life. And actually, at the very beginning of chapter 20, he's beaten severely and imprisoned in Jerusalem because he continues preaching. Now, you might say to me, well, I mean, yes, that is bad, and it seems that Jeremiah is in a hard spot, but at least verses 11 through 13 seem to take a more positive tone, where Jeremiah is expressing his trust in the Lord, and he's expressing that the Lord is still worthy of praise, but verses 14 through the end of the chapter, they get worse. In fact, they get so bad that I want to read them to you. Jeremiah says this in verses 14 through 18. Cursed be the day on which I was born, the day when my mother bore me. Let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities which the Lord has overthrown without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon. Because he did not kill me in the womb, so that my mother would have been my grave and her womb would have been forever great. Why did I come forth from the womb just to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? Jeremiah's words show that he is in a severe state of desperation depression. He's at the lowest point in his life. And rightly so, he has been through a, a whole lot, and much of what he could have expected from the Lord hasn't come true. But we need to read Jeremiah in light of Jesus in Matthew. Because if we read Jeremiah in light of Jesus, we see that what's happening is actually much of what Jesus promises to his disciples is exactly what's going on with Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah didn't know Jesus, obviously, because he came several hundred years before Jesus, but it's the same Lord commissioning him. It's the same Lord speaking to him, making promises to him. So I want to just explore briefly three different places in the Gospel of Matthew where we can see Jeremiah's life being lived out. First, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 19 through 20, we see that Jesus is in the middle of telling his followers that there's going to be a plethora of persecution coming their way. They're going to be dragged before the Jewish synagogues and the Sanhedrin, as well as Gentile kings and princes. They're going to face judgment, beatings, and possibly, and probably, in fact, death for their proclamation. But... Jesus tells his disciples not to prepare beforehand. Don't come up with a defense before the governors. Don't try to manipulate them. Rather, don't prepare, for the Spirit of the Father himself will come and speak through you. Jeremiah was clearly promised the exact same thing. And we see that Jesus clearly lays out that even though the Lord is speaking through you, you will still face persecution. It's something that you ought to expect. Secondly, we have Jesus saying this bit about brother 
turning brother over to the government, or fathers, their children, people closest to you will betray you. They'll turn you over. Jesus is not hesitating in any way, shape, or form to say that familial relationships will save you here. Now, it might be difficult to see where Jeremiah comes in with this, because we don't know much about Jeremiah's family life, but we do know a few things. In chapter 1, verse 1, we find out that Jeremiah was born to a priest in the city of Anathoth. Anathoth is a little Levitical city off to the northeast of Jerusalem, a few miles. And it's interesting because in Jeremiah chapter 11, we find the city of Anathoth has turned against Jeremiah. Jeremiah has spent much of his life to this point preaching and proclaiming judgments against the priestly class in Jerusalem. And Anathoth being a city of priests, it's going to happen. They're going to turn on him. But the people that he is proclaiming the word of the Lord against are those who are close to him. They are those in his own hometown. Ancient cities weren't that big, and you would have known just about everyone. So the people that are persecuting him and vying for his life are those who he knows. A third, Jesus reassures his disciples that those who proclaim the gospel will be vindicated by God. So the disciples are not to be afraid of those who can kill the body, but rather they are to serve faithfully and fear the Lord himself. Now again, I have to reiterate, Jeremiah didn't know the Messiah, so we can't say that Jeremiah's faith in God was based upon the idea of resurrection necessarily, or any of the things that comes with the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord, but we do know that Jeremiah recognizes that God is still worthy. God is still the one to whom we serve. And we can see this because in Jeremiah chapter 20, we have this little bit where Jeremiah is feeling a tension. On the one hand, he wants to stop preaching the word of the Lord because it's brought him such pain in his life. But on the other hand, he recognizes that trying to hold it in will cause internal combustion of sorts. It'll be like a flame of fire in his heart that is burning, withering his life away. He recognizes that serving the Lord is far more important. So Jeremiah, in a way, is an example for us. Now, I said that these readings would be an encouragement for us, and I meant it. And the encouragement is this. When we suffer for the truth, when we are persecuted for the truth, perhaps physically or socially, we are not alone in suffering. Many faithful figures in the Old Testament suffered. Jeremiah, for example. The King David suffered. He was anointed as king and spent the next few years of his life running for his life in fear and uncertainty. And then Moses, even. Moses suffered because he was commissioned to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt and into the Promised Land, but he never made it to the Promised Land. He died before being able to go in. Certainly a cause for suffering. Many faithful figures in the New Testament suffer as well. The apostles, none of them got away with life very easily. They were imprisoned often. They were beaten often. Most of them were executed. And then in the history of our people, the Christians in the church, we have nothing but a long history of suffering. A long history of people who are willing to stand up for the truth, even if it means death. So you're not alone, but even more than that, Jesus himself, the God of eternity himself, suffers first. Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he himself isn't willing to do. He doesn't do anything that he himself isn't willing to endure. So when we suffer, we know that we are a part of this long history of people who are suffering and have suffered with us. And we can take comfort in knowing that our work, our suffering, is not in vain. So to put a little bit of meat on these bones, let's think about 
what this means on our day-to-day lives. I think what these texts would have us do is to not be afraid of the tensions that come with our mission. Oftentimes, we don't want to muddy the waters with people. I mean, religion is one of the top three things that's not to be spoken of in polite company. But what we find in Jeremiah, as well as in the gospel this morning, is that that tension is exactly where we are to be. That tension is exactly where we need to be. So, when you feel the weight of your cross on your shoulder because of the tension of preaching and proclaiming the truth to people that don't want to hear it, know that you're in good company and suffer well. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess thy name may be united in thy truth, live together in thy love, and reveal thy glory in the world. Lord, in thy mercy, Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in thy mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as thine own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to thy honor and glory. Lord, in thy mercy, Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in thy mercy, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of thy salvation. Lord, in thy mercy. We pray for George and Michael, our bishops. We pray for the ministry of the Diocese of Dallas, especially the parish of St. James and Texarkana, St. Paul, Waxahachie, for all the clergy and people. We pray for the Church of Our Savior in Suez, Egypt, for Ehab, their priest. We pray for the outreach of this church, for St. John's Episcopal School, Austin Street Center, White Rock Center of Hope, Gateway of Grace, Genesis Women's Shelter, the Kellerman's Mission in Uganda, Kairos Prison Ministry, Reinhardt Elementary School. 
Lord, in thy mercy, hear Lord, our pray. prayer. We pray for those who are expecting children, Michelle and Dylan and Jamie. We pray for those who are traveling, especially David and Michelle. We pray, O oh Lord, that thou wouldst bless and strengthen thy servants celebrating anniversaries of marriage today, especially Bill and Susie to rally. Lord, in thy mercy. We commend to thy mercy all who have died, especially Wayne Krause, Bertha Prim, Sarah Stanford, Carl McMillan, and Bonnie Dorman, that thy will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed John the Baptist, and all thy saints in thine eternal kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Let us now pray in the words that our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I thought in light of the sermon today, we would uh, conclude with two of the prayers that are on page 816 in the prayer book. One for the church, and one for our enemies. Gracious Father, we pray for thy holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth and with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is an error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. And all for the sake of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Savior. Amen. Amen. O God, the Father of all, whose Son commanded us to love our enemies, Lead them and us from prejudice to truth. Deliver them and us from hatred, cruelty, and revenge. And in your good time, enable all of us to stand reconciled before you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with my spirit. A couple of announcements before our anthem. First of all, happy Father's Day to all fathers out there. Thank you for all that you do. Also want to um, just talk about our worship schedule. We are um, this week having our in-person service on Sunday at 9 o'clock. And then, as you know, Facebook at 11 we're going to add next week our Saturday service to the mix. So we'll have two in-person services next week, Saturday at 5.30, and then also Sunday morning at 9, the Facebook service at 11. Thank you for your patience as we've uh, moved things around and tried to find the best fit. We're going to try uh, to keep this schedule throughout the summer. Two things that could um, interfere with uh, the schedule that we've kept, and one would be um, 
as, uh, as COVID cases uh, are, are spiking a little bit, as hospitals are filling up, if there is a directive from the government or from our bishop to pull back, we may have to go back to remote worship entirely, but we'll let you know about that. The other thing would be um, if our 9 o'clock in-person service um, begins to fill up to capacity where we can't accommodate everyone without distancing, then we will have to expand our Sunday morning in-person uh, services to, um, to two in order to um, accommodate everybody. But again, we'll let you know as we go forward. which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.